y'all, I, I had this whole cushy message and all ready to go. It was like a little tie-in to kind of ease us and to motivate church. And the Lord woke me up and said, get the step in. I said, all right, <laughs> we going in. Some of my most fondest memories as a child, which is crazy to say, is inside of a hospital. Some of my most fondest memories. When I was growing up, I was born as a premature baby. And what my mom didn't know was that my father was using drugs, and it caused my birth to be induced early. Not only that, that it caused everything inside of me not to function properly. I was born blind in both eyes. I was born mute. And I was born not able to breathe because I had two collapsed lungs. And I dealt with these issues growing up. And even when I was growing up, I know just looking back over my life, my memories, it was in a hospital room right down the street when Centera used to be Potomac Hospital. I knew that place so well that every time I would have a cough, I knew I was going to be in the hospital for a week or two. So much so that every class I went to, the kids knew me because they would write cards to me because they knew I was in the hospital. In my life, I remember walking into hospitals and knowing the names of the nurses more than my own teacher. I remember, this is how you know my life was so circular around the hospital visits that I, to this day, still like hospital food. Yeah, I know. I know. No flavor, no nothing. But it, it's nostalgic. It's nostalgic. Y'all pray for my taste buds. They, they've matured over the days. I don't order chicken tenders no more. Y'all, bless God. My life began to be known as the sick kid to the point that even when I was out of the hospital and I began growing and maturing, that I became known by my issue rather than my character. Even when my mom would sign me up for football, before they could check me for my pads or for my helmet, she would say, here's his inhaler. Make sure that he don't run no harder than them kids because if he do... <laughs> Y'all better have 911 on speed dial. I was known for my issue. And there was a situation in my life where I didn't have the problem anymore, but I still had the things around me to make me feel like I did. It's been 15 years since I've had a hard time breathing, but I still know what to do because I only remember the pain. I want to talk to you today about a, a young child who was having the time of his life, five years old and everything's going great. Not only is his life going well, but it's going well because he's royalty. He's royalty and everything is made and given to him. This young man is the grandson of a king and everything around him just reads rich. But what he didn't know was his life that was so well, there was something happening outside of his viewpoint, and he didn't even know that his grandfather and his father had just been murdered. And at the moment of their murder and it being announced back, what happened was this five-year-old boy, his nurse picked him up and began trying to escape because they knew that the people that killed his grandfather and father were coming after him. And the boy, in the arms of the nurse as running, was dropped. And this young boy, who only knew luxury, now couldn't even operate his limbs. And his legs didn't work the way they used to. And he wasn't able to step. He wasn't able to run. He wasn't able to do what he was supposed to do. And this young child, his life in an instant was turned all upside down. His name is Mephibosheth, and I'm going to say that name about 15 times a day, so if I slip, y'all know my heart. All right. <laughs> Mephibosheth is this young boy. He's the son of Jonathan. He's the grandson of Saul. And what happened was these two royal men were killed on the battlefield, and the next one up was him. And in a rush, he's dropped. Today, I want to talk to you about the concept of being embraced by grace. Being embraced by grace. Like I said, every week, you will know that we will be in the word. 
So turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9, 2 Samuel chapter 9. While you get there, I want you to know that this is a message for every person who's felt abandoned, rejected, left, and felt alone. This is the day for you. This ain't the time to feel like, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. No, let it go. If you got the crowd, we got tissues, it's all good. Today is the day that we get our healing. Amen. We won't leave here broken like we came. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, some time has gone by since we've seen Mephibosheth. This young boy who was crippled at five years old was taken from home, and now we're seeing time has passed and years have gone by, and he must feel forgotten. And in 2 Samuel 9 verse 1, we're coming into the moment where in verse 1 it says, David asked, and I'm reading out of the NIV version, David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I want to stay right there for a second. The reason why this sticks out is because he's not doing it on behalf of Saul, but he's doing it on behalf of Jonathan. Right, right, right. His relationship was with Jonathan. That was his best friend. Not only did they have a friendship, but they had a pact. David knew that Saul was trying to kill him. That's, that's Jonathan's daddy. It's something to be friends with somebody and their daddy try to kill you. And the moment that David knew that Saul was going to kill him, Jonathan said, let's make a pact that you would look after my family even after I die. So David comes back and he says, I need to find out, is there anyone who I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? In verse 2 it says, now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba. He said, at your service. Yes, I am. That's me. In the verse 3, he says, the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? I want to pause because I want to disrupt the word that the enemy has been whispering in your ears for the last five years. The lie that no one has been looking for you the lie that no one has been checking for you, the lie that no one is concerned about you. I want you to know that the Lord has people not only having the best interest at heart for you, but they're bringing your name up in rooms that you haven't even stepped in yet. You may feel forgotten. You may feel lost. You may feel abandoned. But the Lord says that everything that he has for you has not been canceled because they chased you. And some of us have given up our hope because we're not where we're supposed to be. Woo. You think your blessings are attached to your location, but the Lord says everything that I have for you, not only will I chase you down with it, but I'm going to send it to you in a way that you never expected. He brings up this question of, is there anyone? I don't care who it is, but is there somebody? Bueller? Bueller, is there anybody that I can call on because I got kindness I need to share? And Ziba answers the king in verse 3, and he says, there is still a son of Jonathan. Check this. But he is lame in both feet. Woo. That means something to me because you couldn't just introduce him as Jonathan's son. You had to attach his issue. And some of us in this room, no one could introduce us just as, hey, this is Marcus. Hey, this is Marcus, but that boy can't breathe. Which is why some of us, and they say you're crazy, but I want you to know you're not. Why you feel a burden on your shoulders when you walk in some rooms and you show the love of Christ and they look at you crazy because someone shared your dirt before you even walked in. Why is it that I feel strange? Why is it that I feel awkward? Because you've been introduced with your issue. Yeah, I used to cuss. I don't cuss as much. But I shouldn't be known as Marcus the Cusser. I found something to do with those other four words. I, I found it. I found it. The Lord's working. And the issue is some of us have been introduced by our issue. 
And there's nothing worse than thinking that your issue overrides your blessing. Which is why some of us haven't attacked life as hard as we should because we think the moment that we step in that someone's going to reveal. Mm. And we think that in the season that we catch our wind and we catch our running speed that something is going to be yanked from under us because of the issues that we have attached to us. What did they think? What does Zeba think? Oh, well, if I don't tell him about the lame feet, maybe he won't want him. Yeah, let's work that. Some of us are so fearful of being introduced in some rooms because the issues that are attached to us should disqualify us. But I want you to know that the Lord, when he places you in the areas that he is blessed, that he is anointed, that he is called, there is no devil in hell that can delay or deny you. There is no lock on a door that can block you. There is no window that can hold you out. I'm here to tell you that everything that the Lord has for you, it's waiting. It's waiting. It's waiting. And Ziba announces this young man, and this has to be surprising for David. Because I'm looking for someone, and then I find out that the someone I'm looking for is the son of my best friend. The son of the one I made the pact with. So now I feel an attachment to what is being introduced to me. And Ziba says, he's lame in both feet. In verse 4, it says, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Even his issue couldn't deter the king. Even his lame feet couldn't change his mind. Even the known fact that he's hiding could not cause King David to change what he was going to do. That's confirmation for someone in this room. If you got to high five someone, I just want you to know there's nothing that could stop what God is doing in your life. There's nothing. There's nothing. You tried to even disqualify yourself in this season, but the Lord says what's on you can't be touched because I'm covering you. I'm covering you. Be righteous, live a holy life, and watch the Lord go to war on your behalf. Yeah, we got we to say righteous and holy because some of us are trying to walk in an authority that is the Lord's and our lives are all jacked up and we're wondering why nothing is flowing. It's because you're cut off. Oh, it ain't just motivation and, and, and cushiness and, and unicorns and rainbows. If you don't live life right, you're wondering why you haven't been called because you can't handle where he's calling you to. Sweet Jesus. Some of us, if we were called to the place that we've been begging God for, we disqualify ourselves in the first five minutes. That's why he hasn't allowed that job interview to pull you through, because you'd act a fool the moment you get some power. Are you ready and prepared for when the time comes for you to get called up? Mephibosheth is waiting and he, he doesn't even know that he's being looked after. But he says, where is he? And Ziba answered in verse 4, he is at the house of Makir, son of Emil in Lodabar. Good old Lodabar. <laughs> the word of that means no pasture, which means almost God forsaken, which also means nothing can come good from Lodabar. No pasture, nothing, nothing good can come from Lodabar. There is absolutely nothing. Some people say the same thing about your hometown. Nothing good can come from Woodbridge. Nothing good can come from Prince William County. Nothing good can come from Northern Virginia, but the devil is a liar and his mama got a mustache. That's how mad I am about the fact. <laughs> your location does not decide how much God loves you. Can, can we step there for a second, y'all? Some of us think that the fact of us getting up and moving our lives to another state will shift our attitude. If you lazy in Virginia, you'll be lazy in Houston. If you don't know how to pray in Woodbridge, you won't know how to pray in L.A. Nothing activates the moment you move. If it's in you, it's... You've been trying to find a reason and an excuse to hold yourself back from what God has called you to. But I want you to know, even when you try to go hiding, the Lord will come chase you down. Yes, Lodabar, he's, he's hiding in Lodabar at this house, and he's been living there. He didn't even know. I can only imagine his mind. Not even wanting to be found in this season because 
if I'm found, surely whoever finds me wants to kill me. And the last time that I was held, I was dropped. Ooh, Jesus. The people who dropped you don't even know what they did to you. You don't even notice sometimes the people who have the greatest intentions for you can also harm you. That's why you got to be careful who you let hold you. Everybody who holds you don't have the best intentions. And some accidents aren't accidents. You ain't crazy. They did it on purpose. They did it on purpose. They, they, they didn't cover you the way they should have. They didn't pray for you the way they should have. And I can only imagine that this young man who is about to be found has a fear in his heart that when someone calls my name, because I'm in a place that has no pasture, that has no growth, and the last thing you want to hear in hiding is your name called. Because if my name is called in a hiding place, surely that means I've been caught. And you've been hearing your name called out in rooms. You've been hearing your name called out in the spirit realm. You've been hearing your name called out in conversations. And the last thing you want is to be found. But I'm here to tell you when they find you. When they find you, they'll find exactly what they're looking for. You don't have to shape it up and polish it. You don't have to accept something new. You don't have to change the inner workings of who you are. If God is for you. Who can be against you? What will they find when they find you? There's a step that we have to make before we're even found, because I want to stop before we go any further and everybody get to shouting and all and good. But then you got to acknowledge your brokenness. You, you got to acknowledge your brokenness. You have to acknowledge that there's something about you that is different. You have to acknowledge something about you is not whole. You've been trying to make excuses for it. Well, my daddy was like that and his daddy was like that. And even my, my uncle Curtis was like that too. So obviously that's who I am. No, 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 no. You have the authority in Jesus' name to break everything that's been named on you, placed on you. But before you can call it out, you got to claim it. Yeah, yeah. I drink a lot, but I won't no more. I cuss a lot, but I won't no more. I, I got a long body list. Yeah, we that type of church. Yeah, some of, mm, we ran out of fingers and toes for body counts. If you don't know what a body count is, Urban Dictionary. <laughs> Catch a teenager in the lobby, they'll be like, ooh, Pastor Marcus was talking about body counts. Yeah, I'm talking about body counts. That's the amount of people that you done slept with, even the ones that you don't claim is still in heaven. I don't care how dark the room was, it still counts. It still counts. Some of us have a little bit of mess in our lives. And we think that it's clean because we don't claim it or we don't acknowledge it. It doesn't matter the fact that you don't claim it or acknowledge it, it's still on you. I remember trying to hide the smell of weed when I would come home. I'd put on Dracar Noir. I'd put on Polo Ralph Lauren. I'd even put the oils that you get from the lady in Potomac Mill who's been there for 15 years. And she'll chase you down. You want to smell? You want to smell? You want to smell? I, I, rem I put everything on. I tried lint. I tried mystery. I tried mints. I tried gum. I tried everything. But the smell wasn't what gave me up. It wasn't what gave me up. It was me acting like something wasn't wrong, even though it was. And some of us in this room, we feel as though we can hide it all, but it's on you. Acknowledge your brokenness. You got to know why you got to acknowledge it? Because you have to acknowledge it so he can take it. He, you have to acknowledge it so God can take it. It's not for you to figure out. It's not for you to fix. I'm acknowledging it to the Lord so you can handle what I obviously have jacked up. You have to acknowledge your brokenness. As we look at this scripture here, it's, it's so interesting to see that Mephibosheth, his life is about to change a little bit. And I want us to look at that first about acknowledging your brokenness because some of us use that as an excuse of why we don't go when we're called. But David says, who is he? Where is he at? And he says he's in Lodabar. 
And at that moment, he says in verse 6, he called Mephibosheth. He brought him to Jacob. He brought him to David, and he says, I'm Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, in verse 6, the son of Saul. He came to David, and he bowed down to pay him honor. He bowed down. It's interesting that even when you have brokenness, you can still bow. Oh, Jesus. Help me, Lord. That's why some of us don't have the excuse of why we don't worship when we're hurting. Okay. Even when this man's legs were messed up, did not work, when he got into the presence of royalty, he still found a way to get low. See, we don't like that because we say that we don't worship as hard when everything's bad. We don't pray as well when everything's bad. We don't understand how to love on people when everything's bad. I'm having an off day. What do you mean you're having an off day? There's no such thing when you're heir, joint heir of the kingdom of God. I may not feel like it, but I still got it. I may not feel like hugging and loving and being all nice, but when it's in you, it's in you. We've made excuses of why we don't press in. I've made excuses of why I don't get committed to church. Well, I got church hurt. That don't mean diddly squat. If you want to know church hurt, check Jesus. The same ones who loved on him when he was doing all the great things, the moment that he said something they didn't like, everything changed. And you telling me that the brokenness inside of you is holding you back from the blessings that comes with being connected and being in a community? We need to press through. He bows in front of David and he says, at your service, he said, Mephibosheth, and he recalled it in verse 7, it says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Not only do we have to acknowledge our brokenness, we have to accept God's love. You have to be able to accept God's unconditional love. In the moment, this had to be so refreshing and so relieving to Mephibosheth. Why? Because I don't know if I'm coming to your house for you to kill me. Because based off your track record, you killed your best friend when you wanted his wife. You, you, you sent someone to the front lines because you wanted to cover up your sin. And now you want me to come to your house? And I, and I know that my granddaddy was chasing after you. You, you want, okay. So it had to be a relief when he said, do not be afraid. And I hear the Lord saying, do not be afraid. The Lord has called some of us and some of us are scared to get in the presence of the Lord because we know what we did. And guess what? He does, too. And he still called you. He still called you. He has not held back what he wants to do in your life because of the dirt that has accumulated. He already knows. There's no search history you can clear. There's no money you can move around. There's no family you can hide in another city. He knows. And here's the thing. He knew before you were going to do it, which is why he gave you the opportunity to get out. Amen. Now, for anyone who says God isn't real, I want you to look back over your life at every single thing you've done crazy. And you just recall just a little bit. There was a tunnel of opportunity to get out of your mess right before you did it. That was God. That won't no sage, that won't no crystals. That oh Jesus. That won't no zodiac sign. That won't no new age spirituality. Sage ain't nothing for turkey and ain't got nothing to do with spirits. There is nothing. There was nothing that could combat the issue that you were facing. That was God. You have to be able to accept the unconditional love that comes with the grace of Jesus. Yeah. It's waiting. It's waiting. The question is, are you able to take the step to go further? He says, don't worry, don't be afraid. Because of my relationship with your daddy, I got you. Just because of the connection I had with someone you came from, I got you. 
There's nothing that you can do to disqualify you from the grace I want to show you. There's nothing. And he says to Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. And he goes on and he says, I will restore to you. Oh, Jesus. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. Somebody getting a praise off of that because there's been some things that have been taken from you. There's been some things that have been stolen from you. There's been some things that people have even tried to convince you is no longer yours. But I hear the Lord saying, I'm causing everything that has been hidden to come to light. I'm causing everything that has been taken away from you to be given back. And not only am I restoring it, but I'm giving it back with interest. He says, I'm restoring you the land from your grandfather Saul. And he said this, and here goes the important part. And you will always eat at my table. You will always eat at my table. I want to close out with this section here for a little bit. Some of us, when we get the invite to the table, we don't even know how to pull ourselves up off the ground because we just don't know how to embrace the fact that not only are we no longer an outcast, but now we're apart. Which is why some of us don't want to join small groups and, and get involved in serving in the church and, and why some of us don't want to build community because we don't see ourselves fitting in. I want to tell you news break. Every person you think is a perfect Christian is going through something. Is there any imperfect Christians in the room? Look at that. If your hand ain't up, the truth ain't even in you. It ain't even in you. I'm trying to hide it. You can, you can quote scripture and go straight to hell. I done heard some people read by soul and mean and nasty. Don't think that their attendance changes their heart. You can be at the church every day, every hour, in your Bible app, in watching sermons, and your life be a mess. But I've seen some people who just come out of the room taking a bump in the nose who got more faith in their body, more faith in their heart, more faith in their spirit to say there's something greater than the mess that I'm in. I may not be where I want to be. I may not be. But I'm going to embrace what God has for me. Amen. The last thing that we have to do is we have to embrace our identity. You have to embrace your identity as a child of God. Amen. No longer are you known or the issue that you've been called. You have to embrace your identity. That means that you have to get beyond the feeling of being a case. What does that mean? No longer are you a charity case. No longer. No longer are you a charity case. No longer are you the back of the line. Not only did he say, I'm restoring to you, but I'm giving you a seat at my table. It is saying like Thanksgiving in a little kid's table where everybody be eavesdropping trying to hear the adults. No, he said, I'm going to give you access to a space that only belongs to my kids. Why is this important? This is important because this has also happened in your life. You may not be Mephibosheth, but you are you. And why is this important? Because there is a God in heaven who has not only sent his son to die for your sins, but his son died for your sins to give you an invite to a table that you don't belong. Well, you. you couldn't earn this seat. Come on. You couldn't pay for this seat. Well, There's nothing that you could do to be invited to this party. And Jesus went to hell, snatched the keys, died, was resurrected again, and now he's giving out dinner passes. He's giving out dinner passes to the broken people. He's giving out dinner passes to those dealing with anxiety and depression. He's giving out dinner passes to those dealing with suicide and divorce and separation. He's giving out dinner passes. The question is, will you embrace your invite? Will you take your seat? Will you take your seat even if it means that someone has to pick you up and put you in it? Oh, Jesus. 
I can only imagine Mephibosheth crawling on the floor and not only now being told you have access, but I'm going to provide someone who's going to pick you up and put you where you should be. I know you don't have the land, but I'm going to give you the land. And in the scripture, it says that David provided servants to work the land that wasn't his. And I can tell you right now, you think you don't have the money. You think you don't have the people. You think you don't have support. But I say that the Lord is crying out from heaven. I'm providing everything you need not one stone will go unflipped not one table will not go unturned I'm giving you back everything that's yours this is the identity of a child of Christ this is the identity of a joint heir of the kingdom I don't deserve it but he gave it he gave it as we close out we see that David provided not only the land, but he gave Ziba, the one who told David about Mephibosheth. He says, Ziba, you and your sons will work the land and serve Mephibosheth. He provided not only back what was his, but he surrounded him with people who could work with him. And some of us haven't stepped into our identity because we're concerned that we're going to be alone, but I'm here to tell you, if you look around this room, there's a family waiting for you. There's a community right here. You have not been abandoned. You have not been let off. You have not been dropped off. Some of us have been in churches for years feeling like we were ghosts in the rooms. But I'm here to tell you that there is a community right here. And you don't have to work for it. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to do nothing. All you got to do is step in. Get in the water. I guarantee you, it's going to be hard. It's going to take work. I can imagine Mephibosheth getting to the table, having to teach himself how to eat like royalty, having to teach himself how to walk and talk like royalty. But I'm hearing the Lord say, you don't have to figure it out because all of us are. The Lord is saying, I'm restoring back everything that you thought was no longer available to you. The love of the king the family and the community that could pick you up when you're hurting and you're broken, it's here. Amen. As we get ready to close up, I, I want you to know if you're staying in this room and you're saying right now, I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying about this, this table, but I don't even know if I'm worthy to get an invite. You don't understand how jacked up my life is. I want you to know there is a seat for you. There's a seat for you. And if you're sitting in this room and you're saying, I want my seat. Yes. I want my seat. You said it's available. I want it. I want you to know that today is the day. The chair is getting pulled back for you. And it's available for you. If you're sitting in the room and you're saying, I'm ready to take that step. I want to go further in. I, I want to get a part of this meal. I want a part of this community. I'm ready to make Jesus my savior. I want you to pray this with me. Everybody's just going to pray together. It ain't got to be awkward. Let's just pray this out, Lord. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. I've messed up more times than I can remember. But Lord, I believe that today is the day that everything changes. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. I believe you sent your son Jesus to rise from the grave. Lord, I believe that you have eternal life waiting for me. So Lord, I invite you into my heart. Have your way. I give you all authority and all power over my life. In Jesus' name, amen.